I'll be having very interesting guests who have personal stories to tell to the world. Welcome to MMB World Talk Show. Hello there, welcome to MNB World Talk Show. My name is Bridgette Tumundimbrun. Well, today's in today's episode there is a gentleman who has contributed 6 years of his life for the education of Mongolian children and also he has prepared well countless teachers, English teachers and trainers around the world. Well, his name is Mr. Korstian Dion. Okay, course. So our show starts with childhood, <laughs> the origin of a person of our guest. So uh, you are uh, one of the three children. I am. I'm the youngest family. of two. Yeah. Youngest, youngest of, two. of three. I've got two older yeah, sisters. Yeah, yeah. Older sisters, yeah. right? So okay. Terrible. Tell, it, uh, tell <laughs> our audience. Tell us about your childhood in Holland. Well, what to say? What to say? I mean, like I grew up in a, in a small town. Uh, it's called Berkel and Roderijs. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. I, I <laughs> you, again? Berkel and Roderijs. It's actually two towns which is merged <laughs> into one town. <laughs> the way you say it really fast, Berkel and Roderijs. That's not half bad, to be honest. Berkel. Berkel and Roderijs. Berkel and Roderijs. Yes. Oh, okay, I'm good. And um, I lived in the Berkel part. Um, mm -hmm. That's where I was born, that's where I was raised, okay. uh, pretty much until I was an adult. Um, I've lived most of my life in the same street with my family. Mm -hmm. uh, my best friend lived in the same street. It's actually a very uh, uh, kind of a you know a small. My, my world was quite small mm -hmm. back in that time, but I had a great childhood. I literally had you know I had everything my to my heart's desire. Mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of great friends, a lot of adventures out there. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yeah, having two okay. sisters brings so its own give problems. Give me three words about your childhood. Um, exciting. Okay. Uh, problematic at points. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, that was more me, not not my surroundings, uh -huh, and uh -huh. happy. Happy. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Pretty bright childhood. Yeah, it? yeah. Like I said, I had really nothing to mm -hmm. complain. I mean, I had everything. Most of the problems that occurred was because, because of me being me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When did you leave Holland? When did you leave uh, I your left hometown? Two thousand. Uh, let, let's let's Sorry. start. Let's start from the leaving your hometown to bigger cities <laughs> or or the Holland straightforward. Um, yeah, actually leaving, I guess I was 19, yeah, to Rotterdam. To Rotterdam? Yeah. By yourself? First to my sister, then by myself, yeah. Uh -huh. Stay with my sister for a while, yeah. Uh -huh. So leaving your parents and yeah, the family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What you want to become as a childhood? What was your uh, dream profession? Or, you know, I had, well, I like as a true child, I had two dream professions. One was a rock star. Rock star? Yeah, it didn't really work out. <laughs> <laughs> but you still play music? I do sing, I, I, I do play guitar a wee bit, but I'm okay. nowhere near rock star material. <laughs> um, okay. And, and, and I wanted to be a professional football player. That also didn't work out, unfortunately. But you do play football? I do watch it quite a bit. I used to play you it a lot. It? Okay. I, I used to play it a lot. Um, like I used to play it competition when I was a child, up until I was about 17, 18, basically until I moved out. Mm -hmm. um, However, you know, here it's like, I don't know that many people play football and I don't really speak But, about. but, you still have uh, bits and pieces of your dreams, right? I mean, bits and pieces, yeah, you never yeah, let go completely, you never Yeah, yeah, go. yeah, because it's dream, it's, it's for yeah. a dream from childhood, yeah. isn't it? Okay, so you have done your degree in business. Yes. And besides that, you've become English teacher, yes. English trainer. Also, yes. Right. So how how did it work out? Like, what was the reason that you become English teacher? Well, that's actually that's probably one of the most interesting questions of um, that period of my life. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, I 
like I think my sister used to say it best. I was interested in everything, but up until a certain point, I never really wanted to go in deep. Mm -hmm. So finding out what I really wanted to do with my life, besides mm -hmm. the two dreams I just mentioned, mm -hmm. was actually quite difficult. So the most logical thing for me to do was to do business, because you're going to use it anywhere, anyway. Mm -hmm. Anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I worked in Ireland for two years, mm -hmm. where I was working in a business. I was working in a, in a company called CIT. I think it's, it's quite a big business, um, financial company. They do okay. leasing of products and stuff. Um, I had a cozy office desk, office job, you okay. know, my own comfy. desk. Yeah. Uh -huh. Office and I just job, comfy. Hated it. I just hated it. You hated it? No, <laughs> with a passion. You know, every every day uh -huh. I did the exact same thing. Office and, work. And, you know, it was very sedentary. I just sat down. I'm not a very sedentary person. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided that, you know, I, I wanted to see a bit more of the world. So I decided to volunteer okay. um, my time From to Ireland. Go from Ireland and mm -hmm. I moved out to a volunteering program in Ghana, in West Africa. Wow, okay. It was a bit of a shock to the system, yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> um, and there I was given the choice whether I wanted to work in a hospital uh -huh. or in a school. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd never worked in a hospital and I really can't stand sick people. That's just not my thing. And okay. my whole family has a teaching background, so that felt natural. School, yeah. school felt natural. Uh -huh. So, I, but, the, but the main reason was you wanted to explore, you wanted to make your life more interesting. I was just not happy with what I was doing and uh -huh. why I was doing it. But did you I, did you get a decent pay from that business? I yeah, mean, the, the pay was excellent. Finance was yeah. excellent. Yeah, excellent. But yeah. deep inside, something it I wasn't mean, satisfying. It uh -huh. it, that, I think that was exactly what was missing. There was no no adventure. There was nothing you know that motivated me. There was no challenge, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I missed that. So when I came to the school, they asked me to teach English and, mm -hmm. you know, it was... In Ghana? In Ghana, yeah. <laughs> okay. I was in a small town. It was outside the... Um, I think it was six or seven bus stops outside the city of Kumasi. And okay. every bus stop is basically a town, so... Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> every bus stop is basically a town. <laughs> it's a, it's right. a very weird time when uh, I think back of it. I mean, that just changed my life in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't even begin to describe, you know, I was raised in Holland. Like I said, we weren't super rich, but we were at least middle class. So, you know, I had everything that my, I never had to pay for anything, um, save for small things. You know, I, I went to Ireland, I had a decent job. And I was sort of, I mean, I'm in a small mm -hmm. town in the middle of West Africa and life is just completely different. Completely different. Completely and different. the fact is, I, I, I love the interaction with people. I love being a teacher, not the, you know, like people listening to me, but you know, that, that dealing with, with, at that point was um, JSS, so junior secondary school. Let's say middle school, about grade seven, grade eight. Mm -hmm. um, How many years ago? This is this 2005. Is 2005. So 14 Almost now. Almost 14 years ago. Yeah. Ah. So um, a little bit about the methods that we use to teach you in, uh, in JET. Uh, I mean, there's literally a million methods that we can use to teach English, but here at JET we use what we call the communicative method, which means the focus is on getting the students to communicate with the teacher or with each other in English. So our outcome is always a, what we call productive skill. So we need to communicate either in speaking or in writing. However, while we're doing that, we also teach, of course, grammar, and we teach reading, we teach listening, but we always focus everything towards an outcome. So we need to have something in either written form or in spoken form. Um, when I first came here, this is November 2012, so it's already six, more than six years ago, uh, my first class was an upper intermediate class, and I assumed uh, upper intermediate standards as I know it on an international level. Uh, which is the CEFR. Um, I was a designated speaking teacher, so I come in and I try to talk to these students, but they couldn't really speak English. So their upper intermediate level was based on their knowledge of English, not necessarily their skills of English. Um, the students were very shy to, teach, to speak to a foreign teacher. Um, so it was, uh, it's how what we call pulling teeth. It was very difficult to get the students to talk. However, now six years later, um, we've developed new methods. Uh, a lot of things have changed also in the world of education, the world of language learning. 
Uh, we do a lot more communication. I, by and large, students are actually quite happy talking to me um, and talking to other foreigners as well. And I think that openness is, it's very important to learn a language. It's, you know, your willingness to communicate, your willingness to use the language. Um, using the excuse of being shy for not speaking English, that it only hurts yourself. You know, I just, if you feel that you find it difficult, just challenge yourself. I'll do 10 words today, I'll do two sentences tomorrow, five sentences next lesson. The more you challenge yourself, the faster you will improve in English. Okay, so you've been to uh, more than 10 countries. Yeah. More than 10 countries. I've worked in more than 10 countries. More than, yeah, you've worked in more than 10 countries. Mm -hmm. And I heard that uh, you had a great view in Nepal. Tell our audience. Ah, that. yes, yes. Like the whole India and Nepal. I was, I was hooked on that particular culture for, I think it's, it, it's interested me for much as I can remember. Mm -hmm. But actually going there and experiencing it just blew my mind and I wanted to do, I wanted to work there. I wanted to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I got this opportunity to uh, do a teacher training course in Nepal mm -hmm. uh, with the idea of staying there for a longer time. Um, and I was a housed with a host family to begin with. That means I was staying with this family, I had my own room, mm -hmm. uh, but they took care of me, you know, they, they, right. I ate with them. And it was actually mm -hmm. a really great time. Um, it was just some funny things because at that time, I don't know how it is now, I haven't, I haven't been there in years, yeah. um, but they had scheduled blackouts, so that means they would turn off the electricity. Scheduled blackouts? Yeah, uh -huh. so because the demand for electricity was so big, they couldn't mm -hmm. su supply it, so for us at five o'clock in the afternoon, our electricity would go off. Okay. So that means by six o'clock it's dark, and that's it. Well, you can only do so much by candlelight, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, you went to bed around 8.30, 9 o'clock, and you wake okay. up at 4.35. Mm. 4.35 in the morning. Yeah, well, I've, by that time I've been sleeping for nine hours, so. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so yeah, my whole rhythm was changed. I remember every morning when I looked out the window, uh -huh. I had a view of Mount Everest. Mount Everest. Right from wow. my bedroom. So that was, yeah, that was something that will always stay with me. It was just really, really uh -huh. cool. Well, teaching in so many countries and looking back to 14 years of experience, what have you learned? You personally learned <laughs> that's a deep one. <laughs> deep one. About teaching, about like... No, as a person. In life. Take it as it comes. Aha. That's a philosophy like, there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think, you know, if, if you want to be capable of, of, of living in foreign countries, and it doesn't matter whether you go from Mongolia to America, or from mm -hmm. America to, to Ghana, or, you know, mm -hmm. from Holland to, to Nepal, mm -hmm. you need to adapt. It is never going to be as you expect, mm -hmm. and it's never going to be the way it is back home. Mm -hmm. So some things you just kind of like, okay, you know what? It is what it is. This is how they do it. Um, so it can be super um, frustrating, but. but... But in the end, you become now, you don't complain anymore. You take it as it is. Yeah. <laughs> I, I try not, I mean, everybody complains all the time. I know, I know, yeah. I know, I know, but um, let's not be a hypocrite, but... Uh, yeah, I, no, mean, I mean, I try not to, about thir certain things, you know, things you cannot change. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. the bureaucracy in certain countries, yeah, I have my ideas about it, I have mm -hmm. my opinions mm -hmm. about it, and of course I'm not happy with a lot of mm -hmm. things, but it is what it is, and you know, sometimes it has benefits too. Oh yeah? Of oh, course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So adaptation. Uh, ad yeah, being adaptive, yeah, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, well, I would call you a global trotter or a global nomad because you've been living around. I um, do, yeah, I do. Yeah, I mean, I'm, moving I'm, around. So many I'm countries. very restless, as people call it. So, mm -hmm. like, if I stay too long and I have no challenges, then, you know, my eye starts going towards a map uh, and I'm like, I've okay. never been there. That's interesting. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, uh, let's find out about Exactly, this place. yeah. Just okay. Keep the maps away from me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go into, well, because we are in Mongolia. Let's yes. Let's go into Mongolia. Okay. How did you get connected with Mongolia in the first place? When um, did, how did it start? Well, Mongolia? I came back from a trip. Um, I was cycling and I was, uh, I was pretty broke. Broke, okay. Ah, yes. Teachers are always broke, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I'd met people that uh, I was working with in Sudan. And I was still in contact with them. And they, they had moved to Mongolia, I think, mm -hmm. a year prior. Mm -hmm. 
And so I was just talking to him and just out of the out of the blue, they said, listen, if you want to work in Mongolia, I can hook you up tomorrow. Oh. And I'm like, wow, Mongolia. Like, I've always been a bit off the beaten path. So Mongolia oh, yeah. was instantly like, interesting. Okay. Right? I'm okay. definitely not ruling uh -huh. it out. So I do some research and I mean, this is November time and it was mm -hmm. very cold. So I could see that <laughs> as something that for me was like, oh, that is pretty intense. On the other hand, never really experienced a winter like that. Okay. Um, I was looking at, you know, pictures of the countryside. I'm like, yeah, that's actually pretty cool. Okay. So I was intrigued. Um, I sent them my CV. They gave my CV to many different schools. Okay. And here I am. <laughs> Six years later, basically. Six years yeah. later. Well, all right. You've been living in Mongolia mm -hmm. for six years, teaching, working with uh, kids. Kids, teenagers, adults, yeah. Kids, teenagers, adults, yes, <laughs> teaching English. So what is the essence of learning English? I mean, uh, no, teaching English, I meant to ask. Because, okay, I know English. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I speak English. Fair enough, yeah. But when it comes to teaching, it is very hard for me. I can't. I, I mean, I tried, though. Yeah, yeah. What is I the essence? Okay, I, what's I see your, your method? What's your teaching method? Ah, oh, there's, <laughs> there's way too many different teaching methods to, to just call out one. Okay. Um, it's about, you know, like if you want to be a teacher, you need to have two things. You need to have the knowledge of the language, which is far more than just being capable of speaking it. Ah, see. Okay. I cannot teach Dutch, even though I'm fluent at it. Uh -huh. So I, I, I wouldn't pretend exactly. that I can. Um, and, it's, and it's personality. You, know, you need to have a teaching person. I mean, if you want to teach someone one-on-one, -on -one, it's not a big deal. In a class, mm -hmm. you need to have a certain personality. If you want to make it work, that doesn't mean that only people with certain personalities can teach. Everybody can learn how to teach, of course, but it helps if you're an outgoing person, mm -hmm. you're a bit talkative, you know, you like to mm -hmm. be around people and stuff. But that knowledge of the language, um, and that goes far beyond just, you know, understanding grammar and stuff. You yeah, know, yeah. How does reading work? How does writing work? How does it mm -hmm. develop? Mm -hmm. You are working at Jet School, but at the same time, you're working on uh, different projects. Yes. Tell us about the projects you're working on now. Well, um, as Jet, we're going to open a, a, a new school. New school? Yes. Is it English school or...? This is project? going to be a general primary and middle school, which is with English as, a, as the main focus. Okay. So, um, yeah, so this is basically like a real everyday, you know, uh, mm -hmm. if, if, if you will, basically. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, and so we're going to be running the Mongolian National Curriculum, which we have to because, you know, we mm -hmm. don't have an international mm -hmm. school license. And on top of that, we're going to be running um, the IPC International Curriculum from Britain. Okay. Um, from and Britain? I, it's a British curriculum um, okay. for international. Which so is you a guys are infusing Mongolian curriculum with the British one? Yes. Okay. The reason why we chose this particular curriculum is because it is adaptable to any other curriculum. So. Um, it, it goes across all different subjects, mm -hmm. right? And it's based on thematic learning. So we get a theme, for example, that, okay. that runs over four weeks. For example, um, at the active planet. Okay. And then over four or five weeks, we're going to look at the active planet, our planet, mm -hmm. from all different perspectives. So from a geological wow. perspective or from, a, you know, a, we're going to do chemistry and we're going to talk about, like, you know, how does a volcano really work? And from mm -hmm. physics, wow. you know, biology. Uh -huh. Through our talk show, we will bring you entertaining personal talks with certain individuals. These individuals will be divided in two categories. Number one is I am Mongolian. In this category, guests will be proud Mongolians who have stories to tell to the world. Number two is I love Mongolia. Through these talks, we will introduce expats and non-Mongolians who are related to Mongolia one way or another. Heartfelt stories of their love affair with Mongolia, the land of blue sky. Some people send their kids, Mongolian kids, some parents, send their kids when they are five years old, six years old, to English schools. Mm -hmm. When they have, they don't have proper Mongolian literature or Mongolian language knowledge. Mm -hmm. What is your take on that? Would you say 
it's okay? Well, I mean, there's or, nothing really wrong with it. Um, okay. I, I personally believe, you know, mm -hmm. like children, especially when they're young, you know, when they're four, five, six years old, they're mm -hmm. sponges. You know, they, they can deal with two languages far easier than we adults can. Ah. Um, so if you put them in an environment, which is the environment that we try to create, we have a Mongolian curriculum, which is mm -hmm. in Mongolian. Mm -hmm. We have the IPC, which is in English. We have extra uh -huh. English, normal, like, you know, as jet, uh -huh. you know, our uh -huh. goal is always mm -hmm. English. So if you can balance the two out, mm -hmm. in the beginning, yeah, they'll find that, you know, they'll find that challenging. But as you can uh, see with people- From with my personal perspective, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> from my personal perspective, I have a kid uh, uh -huh. for myself and then uh, I'm kind of scared that I might confuse my kid with too much language information no. when they are not ready for that. I mean, you're saying it's okay. It's, it's definitely okay because you know what? Um, I think a very interesting thing is like uh, one of my friends who's married to a, to a foreigner is not here in Mongolia. He has a okay. child now two years old and with a mother mm -hmm. speaks language one with the father speaks language too. Now this child doesn't even know that these are two different languages, but already knows they both speak different languages. Mm -hmm. They pick that up naturally, it's called natural acquisition. Okay. They just pick that up naturally. Mm -hmm. So even if you like expose your child to three languages, it'll mm -hmm. probably pick up all three. Now mm -hmm. there is going to be a time, right? And this is, you know, this like when, the, when they're still small, three, four, five, mm -hmm. that they sometimes confuse things. This makes people very scarce, like, oh, you yeah, know, they yeah, don't yeah. know Mongolian, they don't know English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But two years later, they speak both fluently. It's like, uh -huh. you know, we all go, if your child just speaks Mongolian, it goes to a phase where the Mongolian isn't perfect, they make mistakes, they yes. say wrong words, uh -huh. they don't know words. They're just doing that juggling two languages. So they may uh -huh. not know the word for cup in Mongolian, so they uh -huh. say the English word. Uh -huh. And all you need to do is just add that vocabulary, which goes naturally at that age. So you're saying it's okay. I no need to be scared. No need to be scared at all. Uh -huh. Like if you see a person... Their brain is capable of yeah. catching all these. Now, if you but basically take one language out, like if you say, okay, from now on, everything is in English, mm -hmm. yeah, then they're going to lose one language. Uh -huh. If you keep both languages alive, they'll be fluent in two languages, whether they want to or not. Because uh -huh. it's a natural process. We're okay. ba basically programmed to learn as many languages okay. as humanly possible. Okay. Okay, it was a change in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to have convinced you. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. So, of course, mm -hmm. what is your hobby? Uh, what do you like to do for your spare time? Spare, I mean, like, I've got plenty of things that I like. Uh, mm -hmm. Cycling is one of my key hobbies. Uh, movies, I like to watch movies, yeah. you know, hiking. Dating. Dating. Well, oh. I've got a wife, <laughs> got a wife. I'm sorted. But <laughs> oh, you're sorted. Okay. You have Mongolian wife. Yes. Right? Yes. And yeah, like, I, I like being outside. I, that's being outside. The, yes. So do you cycle? Yes, a lot. A lot? Yeah. Okay, what bicycle do you have? Well, I've got two bikes. I've got a mountain bike, mm -hmm. um, you know, that works very well in Mongolia. And I've got a touring bike that I can just, you know, put a lot of materials on oh. and go for weeks if necessary. So. Oh, right. So yeah. Well, what was the farthest distance you covered? Uh, but yeah, I was cycling from Holland to Africa. So it's about, I think we get about eight and a half thousand kilometers. What you say? I mean, eight and a half thousand. Eight and a half thousand? Yeah. You cycled? Yeah. From Holland to where? This is to Africa. Are you crazy? How, <laughs> how that? <laughs> uh, you know, once, it's just I, one I step at the time. <laughs> I can't imagine that. I mean, wow. Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's, it's a dream. Um, I've got many dream trips still ahead of me, but you know, it's wow. like getting on your bike and just kind of keep on going. You know, you've got the tent, you've got everything with you. Uh -huh. And is it like meditation? On the, on uh, there's too many, too much hassle going on on, on those trips to call it real meditation. <laughs> but you do get but in when the you're zone. like really yeah, yeah in the zone cycling. Yeah, yeah. it is like a yeah. It's it's like that part. If you get there, that's brilliant. Uh -huh. But you know, then you get a crazy truck that beeps at you, and then your zone is disappears again or you go through villages and you don't know where you are so wow. there's a lot of things that go on yeah well you are really a nomad <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess i guess in a way yeah, nomad. Oh, yeah. similar to mongolia so. <laughs> yeah no, i mean like it's 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 just a great feeling you know when, when you travel you go from airport to airport from city to city when you want a bicycle you see everything in between yeah. and that's where that's yeah. where the real mm -hmm. you know where the real 
culture is that we all the, th yeah, the yeah. things are then. yeah yeah on that a day ago uh, i usually drive right uh -huh. from home to work home to work and i walked and i noticed that i don't when i'm driving i don't have a chance to look around mm -hmm. explore around and when i i i had to walk to work the other day so uh -huh. i observed so many new things yeah, on the road little shops that you yeah yeah over little there shops. Yeah, like, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and imagine like if you do that for eight and a half thousand kilometers, you'll find a lot of shops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, like it's it's uh, you know, it's 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 a hobby. If if it's not something that you're passionate about, then you know, don't even think about attempting it. Mm -hmm. But it's also you don't need to be a major athlete in able to be able to do it. It's just a matter of you know, keep on going. For me, there's nothing more relaxing than riding a bike. Um, I've ridden all over the world and Mongolia is probably one of the coolest countries to ride a bike in. Uh, Ulaanbaatar is not very bike friendly, but you can commute and it does save you a lot of time. Uh, for example, from my home to my work, by bicycle it's about 10 to 15 minutes depending on traffic lights, by car 45, sometimes an hour depending on traffic, so you can save a lot of time. But outside the city, it is beautiful. You've got the mountains, you've got the lakes, you've got on-road, off-road, whatever you want. You can cycle for days without seeing anyone. Um, so yeah, being outside in the countryside, if that's what you like, you know, you bring a bike and yeah, you can have a lot of fun out here. So this summer, I hope to, um, to cycle from Ulaanbaatar to Ufs. Uh, that's, um, I think, about 1,500 kilometers. So I hope to do that in about 10 days. Um, I probably will be around Nadam because it's the best time. Uh, it's, uh, the weather is good. Uh, winter cycling outside the city, I think it's okay. Inside with the pollution, it can be quite dangerous. So be careful with that. And I hope to see everybody on a bicycle in this summer. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we have only 30 minutes, but uh, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> and. Uh, I want to ask about Mongolia. Sure. Since uh, you know, you, uh, we uh, for the MNB talk show, uh -huh. we have this uh, you as a foreigner, Holland person. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, no, Dutch person. Dutch person. Dutch, yes. Sorry, yeah. Dutch person. Why do you love Mongolia? Do you love Mongolia? Uh, Would you say love Mongolia? I love Mongolia. I have some issues with Ulaanbaatar. Is that is that a fair enough statement? <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. I think I think Mongolia is you know one of the most unspoiled, beautiful countries you could probably ever have the pleasure of being in. Okay. And I can take the car, you drive for 20 minutes and you have literally unspoiled nature. Mm -hmm. However, Ulaanbaatar is a city, I love it because my, my friends live here and I feel home here. And it's, on the other hand, there are so many issues that I think we should do something about, but we can fill up two different talk shows about that, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but okay. yeah, I think you get what I mean. You know, like, mm -hmm. like Ulaanbaatar is a bit of a challenge sometimes to, to mm -hmm. live in. Yes, it is. But uh, let's hope very soon we will uh, overcome the challenges. I think, you know what, it can only get better. Yeah. If everybody looks and, you know, if everybody is heading the right direction, we all want the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it can only get better. Well, thank you very much. I wish you good health and good luck in, well, thank uh, you very much. in your future deeds, endeavors. Endeavors, yeah. Endeavors, yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All the best to you too. Yeah, see you next time. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Yes. <laughs> let's have a, let's grab a beer sometime. Yeah? yeah, not a bad idea actually. Yes. All right. <laughs>